Hello. Hi, how are you? Greetings from California. Oh, good. Yeah, greetings from here in Edmonton. So, yeah, I guess um, we heard a little bit about your research from one of the students that did a project here, but if you could just tell us um, what your device does and why it's innovative. Well, sure. So, you guys hear me okay there? Yes. Yep. Okay. Terrific. So, <clears throat> I guess uh, what we are trying to, let me start by saying what we are trying to build is a biomedical device that will provide some of the benefits of a kidney transplant. And the reason obviously is because the other therapies that are available for, kidney, for patients with kidney failure are fraught with limitations. For the best treatment, the kidney transplant, there's simply not enough organs available. Less than 20% of the patients that need a kidney transplant get them in, the, in North America. Worldwide, it's more like 5%. The other treatment, which is the vast majority, or which, is the, which is what the vast majority of kidney patients have to rely on dialysis, is uh, challenged by poor outcomes, highly expensive, and is very resource intensive. So we've proposed taking a third path, a path that will provide many of the benefits of a kidney transplant while overcoming the limitations that are associated with dialysis. So what is this device? This fundamental a two-stage system, a biohybrid system, the first stage mimicking the filtration component of our native kidneys. Basically that's a synthetic filter enabled by silicon nanotechnology. The second stage is a cell bioreactor that processes the ultrafiltrate generated by this first stage and provides some of the other metabolic, endocrine, immunological functions of the kidney. The two systems work in tandem and we hope that when it comes together, it will provide the continuous therapy, something that dialysis cannot, cannot currently do. It will allow the patient to be mobile and eat and drink freely. Third, by having the device surgically implanted, very much like a transplant kidney, you will minimize the likelihood of in infections associated with chronic <laughs> vascular access, which is a common complication for dialysis patients. And the cell bioreactor will be housed inside our device in such a way as to protect it protect those cells from the body's immune system, therefore also reducing the need for immunosuppression drugs, one of the primary, in fact the primary uh, challenge for patients that have kidney, received a kidney transplant. And by doing that, not only would you uh, keep the cells going alive, the patient uh, and the, or device surviving longer, but you'd also decrease the costs that are associated with, today with immunosuppression drugs. That's really fantastic. It's great to hear that this research is, um, is so far along. Uh, have you started human trials or is that still in the future and what kind of timeline are you looking at? Sure. Yeah, so we've been uh, working this project for the past decade or so, building on some early work by a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. David Humes from the University of Michigan, who showed that the concept of a tandem filter and cell bioreactor is feasible. He actually showed this in a large extracorporeal circuit in humans. So the challenge thereafter became we have a therapy that clearly works in humans and provides a benefit, but how can we make this therapy available to the vast majority of chronic kidney failure patients, about 500,000 or so in this in, in, in North, North America? And so uh, the challenge is fundamentally an engineering challenge of miniaturization. So how do you miniaturize a large extracorporeal filter-based system? Well, we turn to the ultimate miniaturization technology we have, which is silicon microfabrication. So we have embarked on that. We are now currently doing animal studies. We are not in human studies yet. If everything goes according to plan, both in terms of technical milestones 
and funding uh, as, as, as the issues to come up. We hope to get to do the first humans in 2017. Excellent. So you mentioned there's two systems. There's a filtration system and there's a bioreactor. So what I really want to know is um, which of the systems do you think is the most innovative? And in particular, was there an aha moment in your own research where you said, this is it. This is the path that we have to follow. Well, I guess innovation may be in the eye of the beholder, but I can tell you where this started some time ago was when we learned about Dr. Hume's system and its potential for saving lives, I started looking at how do you miniaturize this system. So the first thing that struck me was he was using off-the-shelf technology. So he was using off-the-shelf dialyzer cartridges. He was using uh, available dialyzer pumps, blood circuits, everything that you see in the ICU or in the dialysis clinic. So one question that came up was, uh, yes, I guess, you know, can you miniaturize the system? And I started off having a silicon electronics microfabrication background thinking, of course, we could leverage microfluidics. We could leverage micropump technology, electronics. Maybe thinking in terms of making that whole system, which was the size of two refrigerators and a number of power supplies, probably thinking I could get this into the size of a suitcase. So as I started going down that path and asking questions, well, how much smaller can we make the, uh, the pump? How much smaller can we make the electronics? How much smaller can we make the, micro, the blood circuit? Something that kept on coming to me was everything was designed fundamentally around one component of the dialy existing dialysis technology, which was the filtration cartridge. So to just provide some context, a dialyzer cartridge consists of tens of thousands of parallel hollow fiber membranes. The walls are porous, the central lumen allows blood, and the external to the surface of the hollow fiber usually is dialysate or ultrafiltrate as the case may be. So some things that struck out at me was this dialysate cartridge effectively defined the rest of the architecture. It required a lot of energy to drive blood through the dialyzer cartridge. It just had inherently high fluid resistance. Two, the same hollow fibers did not have great selectivity. And what I mean by that selectivity and filtration, they didn't per filter perfectly all the toxins in the blood. They did, they did a good job of moving very small toxins like urea, but they didn't do a great job of larger toxins, such as a surrogate is a beta to microglobulin, cytokines and the like. And when I looked at that, I just, when I looked to find a reason for that, uh, I realized there's an engineering limitation of the polymer fiber membranes. It is the fiber have pores for filtration, but those pores are not of uniform pore size. They actually vary. They almost have a pseudo Gaussian pore size distribution. And that Gaussian, the, the, the distribution means that it doesn't have perfect selectivity. When you look at a polymer membrane filter, it says the mean pore size is, say, i give an example, five nanometers. But in practice, that's the, that's the average, but you've got more than 30% of the pores being larger than seven nanometers. Uh, you have a, quite a few pores that are below three nanometers. So, as you might imagine, what happens is they just don't have great, great filtration selectivity. The third issue with polymer membranes was these membrane materials. Anyway, so basically that translates into not having a great selectivity. There's a third feature of polymer membranes that's also a challenge, which is these polymer membranes react with blood, react with body fluids in a way that actually uh, causes adverse re reaction. We call it the inflammatory response. Okay, or in some cases, just causes a quicker fouling of the membrane. So, just to recap, the three issues I saw uh, with polymer cartridges. One was 
the, it has a high fluidic resistance, which means you need basically energy hungry pumps to drive blood. Two, the processes are not uniform, which means you didn't get great selectivity. And third, the fundamentally not biologically friendly. So I don't know if it was an aha moment, but somewhere I think it came to the realization is I'm spending all this energy trying to think of miniaturizing the system, but in a, separately for the pumps, for the fluidics. But how about I just try to think of a different filter? Maybe the way to do this is forget the polymer cartridge, which has been the mainstay for dialysis for about 45 years. Maybe the way to think about this, how about we make a different filter? It would then allow us to overcome some of the issues. So maybe that was the time I thought, maybe we can move away from engineering and just do incremental miniaturization to thinking about less fundamental look at a different filtration component and less work backwards. And if we do that, what does that mean? Well, it turns out we can manufacture silicon with very precise features. Two, uh, basically we can do it in a manufacturable way. And three, by bringing in the advances with biomaterials, modify the surface of the silicon to be a lot more biologically friendly than is possible with polymers. So that's the convergence of the approach we brought, I think, to the table. Great. So, and th just to that last point, I'm curious to know, um, silicon on the nanoscale ha is mostly deemed safe for biological use, uh, but there is some issue with at least very small silicon structures being metabolized by the body. Um, and you said that you've done something now mm -hmm. to make it a little bit more biologically compatible. So, yeah. um, do you expect the devices to have a long lifetime when they are in use? Or is it going to be one of those things that needs to be solved a little further down the line? Yeah. Uh, great question. So our experience has been that, uh, that we address the device as a complete unit, not just by silicon by itself. But going back to silicon, just for a second, we are not exposing the body to unit silicon components. So nanoscale silicon components by themselves. So if you think, if we just take a step into the realm of nanotechnology, uh, we are probably one dimensional nanoscale structures, meaning that the actual pores in our silicon filter are on the nanoscale, actually we're operating at about sub 10 nanometer scale. But the rest of the silicon structure is micro and macro scale. So, I want to contrast this to silicon nanoparticles uh, or si uh, silicon microparticles. Our silicon is actually not free in the sense of a micro or nanoparticle to get this, uh, absorbed into a cell by itself. Having said that, do, I, do we uh, think silicon is safe? And the, answer, the short answer is, you know, we feel obviously it's the, pot the potential for safety is definitely there. We've done a lot of work in that realm, but I think if we have to convince the FDA or you have to convince the larger community with this work to be done. In short, we approach biocompatibility in a couple of ways. So what the main challenge for the uh, device in terms of, in, uh, in terms of bi biocompatibility is blood clotting in the device, and two, blood, the uh, proteins in the blood blocking the pores, and they're both related, because blood clotting inherently starts with the protein absorption on the surface. Now, let me put silicon in a little bit of context. So silicon in its native state is covered by a thin layer of silicon dioxide, or silica, and some of you may know this, but, or may not, but silica is actually inherently thrombogenic. So in fact, a key test for in the old days for looking at how likely your blood is, is going to clot as a function of say anticoagulant is to put some drops of blood into a test tube, meaning glass, and then shake it and look up to see how long, you know, the reaction between the walls of this test tube and the blood took and to cause it to clot. So blood is that the glass is inherently thrombogenic. So silica is thrombogenic. 
So what we decided to do was to actually attach biologically friendly moieties, chemical groups, to the surface of the silicon. So we, we basically identified the way to make the silicon biologically friendly to blood was to perhaps attach surface functional groups that are natural to the body. So one of my colleagues in Cleveland, Ohio, Dr. Raja Mershant, actually has identified the sugar molecules that line the inside of blood vessel, which is called uh, endothelial cells. There's a, there's a sugar moiety called oligosaccharides. He's able to synthesize the oligosaccharide. And what we worked with him was to find a way to graft that oligosaccharide to the silicon membranes. Now, just to color the situation, there's a lot that there are very many uh, biologically friendly coatings available. And only that oligosaccharide is not the only one that's possible. And when I went out there and surveyed the landscape for what about biofriendly materials, I got a lot of offers. The challenge was many of these biomaterials would be friendly with blood, but in the process of coating the membranes, they would block the pores. Remember, we are talking about 5 to 10 nanometer pores. So if I'm going to put a coating that's microns thick, that's not going to work for us. So the, I think the key to this was to find a way that was a biologically friendly material, develop, develop a protocol so we can attach it to the surface covalently, so get a robust attachment, but do it in such a way that's only one or two molecule layers thick so that it doesn't block the pore. And that's where a lot of the work that my colleagues undertook really paid off. So they're able to attach this oligosaccharide and we've extended this to other biological friendly materials such as polyethylene glycol and a few zwitter ionic polymers where just by controlling the chemistry uh, protocols, basically the chemical reaction times and the conditions, we can just achieve one or two layers thick of coatings that allow the pores to be open, but from the perspective of blood, it thinks of it as just the endothelial cells in a blood vessel. So that's our approach to overcoming the thrombogenic uh, issue. It turns out by using the same coatings, uh, because they retard re 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 uh, absorption, they also prevent fouling of the membrane over a long time. So our feeling is that by pushing this strategy, we should have a device that will last a long time, years, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions up to now on the filtration side? Because the next thing I want to ask is about the, the bioreactor. So if you have questions about the filtration side of things, I've got one last question about the filtration side, and it's Sure. Uh, what method are you using to produce the pores? Are you producing pore silicon using a standard uh, wet chemical etch, or are you doing something different? Okay, well, you're, you're a silicon guy, obviously, know your silicon. Terrific, congratulations. So, uh, having come from silicon, I did look at a number of different ways, and uh, we actually do not use uh, porous silicon, although it's a, it's a technique I looked at early on. And I probably want to look back again later. So, and we actually, and I'll tell you why we don't, didn't use it. We just found it very hard to reproduce over and over and over again because the conditions of it's very sensitive to all kinds of conditions. Uh, and scaling up, scaling up uh, for many many wafers was hard to do. So, what we are doing is something called the sacrificial oxide technique, and the uh, uh, the strategy there is. To make sub 10 nanometer pores, you can't really pattern by lithography, whether it's X ray lithography, which is impractical in terms of expense, EBM, which is impractical in terms of expense and time, or regular optical lithography, which is a limit of about 100 nanometers using state of the art uh, tools. So, but what we can do is we can grow silicon dioxide down to a couple of nanometers by thermal processes. So, this is uh, that, another feature of silicon. It's a very uh, uniformly uh, grown. Uh, uh, sorry, silicon dioxide will grow uniformly on top of silicon, uh, just by controlling the thermal conditions. 
you can you can modulate the thickness of the silicon dioxide. So we have taken the approach of growing very thin films of silicon dioxide, three, four, five, six, seven, ten nanometers, and we can do this over and over again just by dial, changing the dialing diodes on our furnace, and we can tune the thickness, and that silicon dioxide becomes the template for the subsequent pour. So by doing by by doing thermal oxidation, we can apply this to many batches of wafers in a in a, in a instead of doing it in a serial manner, we can do this in a parallel fabrication manner. Great. Uh, probably only interesting for me personally. So um, the next thing I want to ask is something that I'm not so familiar with, and it's the um, um, the bioreactor right. side. Sure. Yeah. So the second the second step in the process. So if you could just kind of give us an overview of how that side works. Uh, sure. So let let me. What we're trying to fundamentally do is mimic the kidney. So let me just take a little bit about a step back to the kidney. Our kidneys, hopefully you and mine and everybody in the room who's healthy, each kidney processes about 90 liters uh, of blood, uh, and rather generates about 90 liters of ultra a day. So it processes blood, and that we generate 90 liters of ultra a day. But even in our happiest party days, will not pass out 90 liters of uh, urine, right? What happens is the rest, the rest of the kidney, the tubular parts of the kidney, reabsorb most of that such that our together in both kidneys, we probably produce about one liter of urine. So what happens? So the glomerulus, the filtration unit, produces about 90 liters per day, along with urea, along with sugars, along with sauce. They just go, they just are filtered through basically almost a size, purely size selective, and there's a little bit of a charge, but fundamentally a size selective filtration process. In the process you're generating, if all that went out, would dehydrate. So the... You're telling us about how the concentration step renders about a liter of urine at the end of the day. Right. So, um, Obviously, what happens is the tubule reabsorbs uh, most of that. So, some of my colleagues here call the tubule uh, the Santa Claus membrane, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because it actively picks up what the body needs and discards and doesn't and discards what the body doesn't need. And interestingly, it's an active process because it. Uh, and I think there's an interesting reason why it does it that way, because the body doesn't necessarily know what is bad when it filters stuff out. It just filters out everything that's small below a certain molecular weight, anything below the size of albumin. But the cells in the tubule selectively pick out, I, you know, hey, the body needs sugars, the body needs salts, the body needs, uh, you know, some of the uh, proteins to pull that back. But it doesn't need urea. So, what we decided to do was, because of that process, uh, which said, let's try to mimic the same filtration and reabsorption feature in our device. And if we do that, we can make this device operate independent of dialysate. There's no need for any additional fluid. So what happens, the first stage comes up with the filtration. The second stage, the bioreactor, basically is lined with kidney epithelial cells. And the cells process the ultrafiltrate reabsorbing much of the water and many of the salts and sugars back into the bloodstream. And we, we, we took the approach of doing the, bio, of doing the second stage with cells because we did not, at the time, uh, uh, actually I think still that's true, they're just not, there's not simply enough engineering to precisely pick out everything that the body needs in a long-term reliable way. So I like to think that we are growing what we can't engineer with a cell bioreactor. Okay, so uh, one of the questions that uh, a student here had was about the longevity of the cells in the bioreactor and what techniques you use to uh, basically ensure their health and possibly even regenerate them um, if, they, if they die. And that's a great question. So cells and cells, 
that especially not in the native environments are not in a happy state. So it is very likely that they will not survive forever. And that's one of the common, uh, I guess, questions I've received. So the way we've tried to approach that, that question is as follows. So we are taking cells and growing them on, instead of a bioreactor, bio on a substrate that's a uh, biological matrix. So that's one way we try to provide a biological and friendly substrate for the cells to grow on. Second, to keep the cells alive, we need to be able to provide them nutrients. As it turns out, this ultrafiltrate that the, is generated by the glomerulus is actually full, is rich. It's coming from the arterial system. It's rich in oxygen. It's got sugars. So it's got all the effectively all the nutrients the cells would require to survive. So the cells basically obtain nutrition from the ultrafiltrate. Now, how long can they last? And we know most experiments that have been done in the lab with tubular cells, people need to report them for a few weeks and that's the metric of success. And in our case, that's obviously not a sufficient metric of success because we, we want this device to last for a long time. So we have had to take some studies on our own uh, to see how far these cells will continue to maintain their function. And we have had them in the lab for two months, two to two and a half months, where they continue to grow and maintain their function. We also know that if the cells die, or if one of the cells die, at least in the limited experiments in our lab, it seems the other cells, uh, you know, fill in, divide and fill in the empty spot. Now, what I can speculate is what happens in the long term. This process may be sufficient for the long, long term for years, but we don't know. What we do know most definitive, definitively is when Dr. Humes uh, worked with his large-scale bioreactor for patients, he had to have the devices ready and perfused to go because he never knew when a patient would be available. Looking at his data, the longest he had kept any of these cells alive in a perfusion circuit where there was flowing media was about six months. So we are confident that they can survive for six months. The other thing that Dr. Humes and we have done is actually to show that we can freeze the cells in, a, in liquid nitrogen and thaw them. And we've shown that we can freeze them for three months, thaw them and, keep, and then gain, gain back functionality after that. So we feel like these cells are robust or can be robust enough that they will survive for a long, long time. Now, as engineers, you have to think about what, the, what happens if ultimately all of them die and they're not growing back. So to that, I answer as follows. Remember, our device is a little box that has cells encapsulated. So there are two ways you might approach it. One is, let's replace the box with, new, with a new batch of cells. Or and we have not done any of this. Or two, is let's just inject a new fresh batch of cells. So that would be my response. Well, that sounds very intriguing anyway. Um, a follow-up question? Yeah, so when those cells die, if you assume that you have limited space in this box of cells, hmm. at a certain point you, need, you would probably need to clear out some of those dead cells. So it seems to me that simply pumping in more stem cells might not be the best option. Okay. Um, can you respond to that? Is there a way that you could possibly use the body to remove some of those cells? I know there sure. would be a problem with immune rejection at that point, but... Okay, so the question is basically, supposing that the cells do die, um, by what method are they carried outside of the body? And does that interfere with your idea of being able to re-inject them into the bioreactor? And just... Uh, on top of that, is there any way of using the body's own mechanisms to replenish those cells? Gotcha. Okay, good questions. So when the cells die, uh, they will just be directed to wherever the rest of the ultrafiltrate, the ultrafiltrate that's not being reabsorbed is directed, which is the bladder. So if they die, they just go downstream into the bladder and get, presumably, you know, passed out from the body. Now. 
uh, let me see. Oh, 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 there's an associated question with that. Can you remind me what that question was with that? So, um, does injecting new new cells into the bioreactor interfere with um, the dead cell removal? Gotcha. So uh, again, we have people uh, like uh, Dr. Solis, well, clinicians. But I think one way to think about it is, if the cells died, uh, and there would be a period of time where you'd be losing a lot of fluid. So in that case, one way to think about it is you're actually in the hospital now where you're getting replacement fluid through a, through a catheter. So you're not dehydrating, but you're injecting the cells to, you're injecting the cells in, into, this, into the device to get into confluence, which would, pro, which would take in our case anywhere from three to five days. So you might imagine in that case, you might need a three to five day uh, a session in the hospital so you're being continuously infused. Uh, in terms of uh, your second question about can you use the body's own cells to somehow regenerate this, the, these cells, the answer is yes and no. So I, I, I glossed over a certain point. The cells are in, the, in this bioreactor are isolated from the body by a membrane, the same silicon membrane, and the membranes are so have the pores are large enough to let nutrients and sugars and water go through, but they're too small for the body's immune system components, such as antibodies and cytokines, to get through. So the body's cells can't internally go into the bioreactor and regenerate. But what we might do, and this is early stage research that my colleagues are undertaking, is how about we take a patient that's has kidney disease, now has not had kidney failure yet, but has had kidney disease. Kidney disease, you go through a series of stages, one, two, three, four, five. Maybe you're going down and you've had a biopsy and you have all the indications that you might go into kidney failure. How about you take that biopsy and isolate the proximal or the other tubular cells that are healthy and culture those cells outside and store them in this in the liquid nitrogen so that when you do when and if you do end up in kidney failure you might use your own body cells and to be used in the bioreactor so that's one way we've actually probably you know speculated on how one might use their own cells for their own bioreactor that's excellent um oh another another just follow-up question i think on the same topic go yeah. go ahead yeah, you could. Why, why don't you go here. Talk to him. At one point before we leave, I'll show you who you're actually speaking to. I realize that it's you know you're just talking to me, but there's a whole room full of people here. All right. So well, your your okay. next question. Hi. Hi. Uh, so to what extent? Do you oh, do you want this microphone oh, for the moment? Just hold it. Yeah. So to what extent do the cells in the bioreactor structurally? resemble the cells in a natural kidney and does this affect their metabolic and endocrine functions at all yeah good great question again um, you are actually hitting on something where the renal epithelial tissue culture is actually limit we just don't know enough about uh, best ways to do this say as we know for uh, myocardial cells or for that matter you know or cartilaginous cells or orthopedic cells. So we look at the phenotype of the epithelial cells uh, through a series of uh, structural as well as immunohistochemical markers. So the epithelial cells in the kidney uh, have a tight uh, junction with brush borders. Uh, they're also ciliated. A ciliated, uh, the cilia we hypothesize, or people have hypothesized, basically mechanotransduction units that modulate the reabsorption. And they also express a lot of transporters that are, re are responsible for sodium and water transport. So our assays are basically look to see if we are achieving the same types of features. So structurally, we want to see cells that grow to confluence, they exhibit uh, brush borders, uh, we stand for something called ZO1, you, and to basically see that we have the tight junction. Uh, we also stain 
for the cilia and we are able to see the cilia. Uh, we also have done um, confocal, uh, a, a cross-sectional confocal microscopy, I'm forgetting the, the term, but in the, Z, in the Z direction, and we can actually see they are very much cuboidal as they in the, in the, and they, are next, they line up next to each other. Now over time, this is really important, over time, so they will be like this in this stage, but often, unless you have the conditions just right, over time they will lose that structural configuration. So a key challenge for the research is how do you modulate the conditions so that you can maintain that cell ar uh, microarchitecture effectively uh, uh, over a period of weeks, if not months. Okay, that's that really actually answers my question. Another question I have is a hypothetical question. Is it possible to take some endothelial or epithelial cells from the patient, culture them, but immortalize them without compromising the function of the epithelial cells? Okay, so is it possible? Uh, I guess uh, somebody's going to say it's possible. Uh, we have not been. We have not. We have not done that. So there is a lot of research going into. Immortalizing, so they they are they are human kidney cell lines, right? But we, we from our experiments, and uh, we've looked at something called uh, HK2. There are a whole bunch of cells you can actually buy uh, from vendors. Uh, but what we've found is immortalized cell lines don't function as well as primary cells. So one great example is the. I forget. I, I want to say it's one of these human cell lines we purchased from Lanza. Uh, they grow in culture, they show all the metrics in terms of the immunohistochemistry, but they don't transport water, or they transport very little water. So they will have the tight polyjunction, they'll have the cilia, but they don't transport water. Somehow, somewhere in the process of immortalization, we have interrupted the machinery. So the approach we have taken so far is Yes, those are great for studying certain aspects of the bioreactor, but ultimately, unless somebody with more cell biology experience solves the problem, we probably have to rely on primary cells. Oh, that makes sense. Um, those okay. are all the questions I have for now. Excellent. Thank <laughs> you. So, just one last question, I think, before we uh, say goodbye today, but... Um, what excites you most about this research and where do you see this going in the next 10 years? So I guess what excites me most about this research, one is I think at first I started, I started this project as a scientific, with a scientific intent, hey I may be able to bring a contribution to the research of kidney disease or kidney failure treatments. And I felt that using the silicon, an engineering toolkit, we could make a real impact. Uh, and that has not changed. I'm very excited by the fact that silicon, microfabrication, silicon nanotechnology, silicon electronics, and the manufacturing capabilities associated with it can actually impact medicine, and especially kidney failure in a, in a meaningful way. But I think what excites me more now is over the past few years, I've heard from patients, and I urge many of you who are have interest in biomedical applications to listen to listen to some of the patients that are afflicted by the diseases that you may hear about. So the patients are are what inspires us. Uh, one of the things in this in the United States and probably in Canada, uh, kidney disease research is significantly underfunded, such that there are not many researchers actually tackling the problem. So to give you an example, NIH, the primary funding agency for health research in this country, spends about $28 per kidney disease patient a year. So $28 per kidney disease patient per year. In contrast, cancer is something like $300 per patient per year. Now, if you look at the mortality of kidney failure 
is comparable to some of the actually across all cancers is actually worse to be a kidney failure patient than in cancers because across all cancers the and and for kidney failure it's about 25 percent you know give or take or take a few percent now the disparity in funding research is very high so patients have been very desperate for alternatives and so we hear about the challenge of getting new treatments to kidney failure patients that there's been not very much development. The dialysis machine has fundamentally remained unchanged for the last 45 years. Except for the introduction of uh, immunosuppression drugs, kidney transplant patients have not had any dramatic treatments. So fundamentally there's been a dearth of research in at least research results in kidney failure uh, uh, treatment. So patients are very attuned to that and they feel very desperate and when they see uh, efforts like ours being made, they are, uh, they are very encouraging, to, encouraging and supportive towards us and many of them have told me and told our team, we understand research is arduous, research takes a long time and chances are for many of us or for in, in particular because it would not be, I will not be there to benefit from it. But I want to let you know that this is important. I'm glad that somebody is looking into kidney disease uh, alternatives. So to me, that's actually very inspiring. Uh, and I hope that uh, not just myself, but I and others who take on this challenge will come on and really try to not just do something on the research side, but also people on social sciences can address the challenges this patients face People in public advocacy can go fund for uh, advocate for more research, and government can mobilize since the incentives are aligned with businesses to support new treatments. Excellent. Well, just before we hang up here, I'd like to uh, have everybody thank you, but I want you to be able to see them. So why don't we thank Dr. Roy for his excellent talk? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, back to Kim. Let me just say to everybody there. First of all, thank you, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. But more so, if you are ever in the Bay Area, please come check out our lab, and I hope you'll read a little more about kidney disease as well. I'll come down there. Great. Thank you very, thank very you. much. Okay, well, I think uh, that's it, and, and we're very, very grateful to you for uh, spending this time. I sort of see a, see a race now, and it's partly scientific, partly... Uh, regulatory of whether the bio-artificial kidney or stem cell generated kidney or the xeno uh, generated kidney will reach the general public first, but it's a very exciting race. And I think there are many unpredictable uh, factors there, but I, I certainly wish you well in, in this. It was wonderful to meet you in person. And thank you very, very much for taking part in Future Day and uh, in this course on uh, technology and the future of medicine. So I appreciate it. Okay. 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 Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.